Hi, I'm Eileen Roach from Designs and Machine Embroidery, and thank you for joining me today. I see some of you are already talking about um, that you are at home working on your Baby Lock Solaris and using your new weightless quilter along with the Monster Hoop. And thank you, Janie. I'm so glad to hear that you're using those products. It's awesome. Um, hello, Dory from Naples and uh, Marilyn. And Jean Gunther, you are making masks. We're gonna talk a little bit about that drive today. I'm so happy to hear that you are um, jo joining in that drive for sure. And hi, Judy from uh, beautiful and windy Hawaii. Uh, we really appreciate when you write in there and tell us where you're calling from. Uh, Misha Pennington, it's nice to have you here. I guess all of us are home working on lots of different projects, right? And when we do that, we most certainly have some um, mistakes, mishaps, shall we call them, right? And if you're like me, they happen uh, every once in a while. In the beginning, when you first start embroidering, you will have challenges and you won't really understand why you have some maybe reoccurring problems. But if you take some time and apply common sense, it's often pretty easy to figure out where your problems are having are happening. Uh, Marianne Adams, welcome. Uh, you're on your trek back to uh, Iowa in New Mexico. And Marilyn, you're working on some new hoops. Oh, Kathleen Williams, you're waiting for hoops for FAF. Well, me too, <laughs> me too. You know, with this COVID-19, we are having some uh, delivery issues and so forth. So I don't have a delivery date for you at this time, but as soon as I know, I will share it with you for sure. So let's go ahead and uh, get started on some of our mishaps, right? But before we do that, I would like to um, draw attention to one of our dealers. Oh, I lost one of, oh my goodness, I lost my PowerPoint. I wonder how that happened. Um, so we'll just dance here a little bit. You all talk um, lovely, you know, between, amongst yourselves. And I'll see if I can't get my PowerPoint back up. Janie, why don't you tell everybody what you are stitching on? If you would just put a comment in there and tell us exactly what kind of project you're working on, that would be really helpful. And I'll just go in here and get my... Uh, Get back in here to the link. And then I'll be able to um, share with you all of the mishaps that I've been making through the years, right? And Misha, you want to know how to fix those boo-boos. Me too, for sure. Okay, so let's see. Application. There we have it. Okay, there we go. Thanks everybody for your patience. I appreciate that. I don't know what happened. This computer, you know, I work with two computers here. So, um, you know, and anyway, I appreciate your patience. So, you know, I recently, yesterday I worked at home and when I have lunch, I, I watch the ABC News uh, local television channel and they had the national feed on. And lo and behold, here was Jane, Jan Brosnick from Pins and Needles in the Cleveland, Ohio area. And um, I was so excited to see her on ABC News. And she is running a million, million mass challenge. It's a global sew-a-thon. And, you know, she's not the only one. I've heard this million mass challenge from several resources. But, wow, isn't that wonderful that we have so many people around the um, globe really, and most certainly here in America that are um, working to uh, make these masks, get them out to our healthcare workers, get and then use them for um, family and grocery store workers and everywhere. Um, okay, so anyway, let's, let's go on over to, now I'm kind of lost my place here. Isn't that funny? Oh my goodness, it's crazy. Um, I don't know how to remove that banner now. Let's see, there we go. Okay, we can move, remove that. And then we have to go back and remove that. 
Oh my goodness. Crazy day. Okay. So you can check out pins and needles. You can get her, her, her mask patterns. Um, they're a free download on her website. And you can also, of course, uh, if you need supplies or kits, she sells them too. So check it out. But before we get into our mishaps, let's take a look at some of the recent dime doors that are up on the web. Uh, this is the original sample, my two um, samples that I stitched. And then I found a Sandy Hulsart. How adorable is this? And she, of course, had to add a basset hound in the foreground. So I kind of gave you a magnified image of that. Isn't that fun? She, I imagine she has one at home barking in her yard, maybe. And then Chris Yost really added a lot of her own personality to um, her, her door. So she used bright, colorful fabrics, which I love. And at the top uh, on the door, she put a bird's, uh, a, a birdhouse and then a butterfly. And then what else does she have next? She has a hummingbird feeding off the wisteria. And then down on the bottom in front of the, the pot, she's added a wheelbarrow and also a watering can. Oh, I just love that. I think she did a great job. Really, really nice job. And then Carol DeGaris, she's added uh, an Easter bunny or just a bunny and some flowers in her foreground. I thought that was really well done. Now we get into some really colorful boots. Cindy Night King on the left, she likes purple boots and Muriel Butler on the right has added flowers to her boots. Now, if you remember those little wellies, they're just a solid fill. It's just a yellow is what I provided in the stitch in the downloadable free door. But you'll notice that she added some further embellishment. They're tiny little flowers. I think that's an awful lot of fun. And she has a, uh, a robin on the, um, on the steps there. And I was just so impressed with the blue boots on the left is Judy, Cushing's um, project just looks beautiful. And then a, a really lovely offering from Terry Brockway, um, Frasto, Frasto um, is her name. And I, I just had to add that. I thought it was really beautiful. And then Luann Green, Greenberg on the left has added a very tone on tone. The, the color of the door is very similar to the wall color. It's really lovely. And I just had to give another shout out to Reen Wilkinson of the Embroidery Garden. She uh, posted a close-up photo of her door. And I think that's just beautiful with the 3D flower from her lace collection there. Really, really nice. So, but I know you all came to talk about embroidery mishaps, right? And for sure, I've done my share. That is for sure. So I thought I would share some of those problems with you, because I know that you all, you come across this too. So I usually tell people that what is really important right before you touch go is to check the back of the fabric. So here in a multi-needle hoop, this looks like it's gonna be just beautiful, right? I stitched it, but I was in a hurry and I did not check the back of the hoop and lo and behold, it is stitched over the hoop. Now, luckily, this it doesn't have a lot of stitching that's capturing the back of that tail. So I probably could, you know, take a seam ripper and take the time to rip that out. If I had, you know, dozens of those towels, I don't know. Time is money, right? You have to, if you're on deadline. Now, if you have if something like this happens to you, where the back of the fabric is stitched all the way, all the way through, then with a heavy fill stitch. Do you think it's salvageable? Well, I don't. I would probably put that in the trash. And I can tell you one time that happened to me on the set of Sewing, Sewing with Nancy. Oh, it, it was the very last scene at the machine on the taping of the day. And thank goodness, the audience, you know, the viewers were not able to detect that. But I remember Nancy and I, you know, going through the, the taping and so forth. And when we finish that task, we exhale, cameras off, and I pick it up, pick, take the hoop off the machine, and, and lo and behold, <laughs> it's stitched to the back. So we had a pretty good chuckle about that. And Diane Russell, you say those, Diane Russell King, those mistakes look familiar. Yeah, and Martha, you've done that for sure. Isn't that fun? I know, we've all done this. 
Oh, and Karen, you did it on a quilt last week and took out the stitches. Definitely on a quilt, I would take out those stitches too, for sure. For sure. Okay, but sometimes it's not the back, it's the front of the hoop, the part that's most visible that we have a problem with. Like maybe you stitch over your Target sticker, right? I've done that for sure. This Target sticker is white. So if I rip that off, you wouldn't really be able to see it beyond behind the stitches, right? But we also have um, we also have yellow Target stickers. So sometimes if you stitch over a yellow Target sticker, you're in for trouble. And let's see, Misha, you said that sewing with Nancy taught you so much and you miss her in that show. Boy, I do too. And you know, I truly learned how to sew by watching Sewing with Nancy. I took a class uh, locally at Hayes Sewing Machines in Clifton Heights, Pennsylvania, a long, long time ago. But after that, I just tuned into Nancy and that's how I, you know, got my sewing skills up and I miss her too, for sure. Our dear friend, Nancy. Um, let's see. Okay. Also on the top of the hoop. Now, sometimes you are using a sticky stabilizer maybe, and you have a garment positioned down on that sticky stabilizer, but the edge, like in this case, the lapel of the shirt, you know, is not caught on that stabilizer as nicely as you would like it. And it has a facing. So most likely the facing is stuck to the sticky tear away, but not the actual top. So if you turn around while it's stitching and you'll hear, you know, a sound of the machine that can just make your blood curl. And when you turn around, this is what is often happened. The, the fabric is actually caught in the foot and it is stitched all the way through. Yeah. And let's see. So, you, um, oh, Sue, Sue Warner, you bought your first uh, serger from Gray's, from Hayes. Yes. Well, I know them well. He grew up in Delaware County. So Misha, yeah, the foot is the worst, right? When that gets stitched over, it is just horrible. Just, just horrible. I know. So let's see. Mistakes happen from Shelly and when it, only when you look away from the machine the minute you look away from the machine is when a mistake happens it's very annoying very very annoying yeah let's see Diane Russell King your son is 40 and says he still remembers sitting with you through sewing with Nancy shows yes um yeah my well my son is not 40 but uh he's about 12 years younger than that. And uh, he most certainly had to sit through some of them too. Okay, so let's see, let's move on. But what about breaking needles? Sometimes you'll, um, you'll notice that needles have, um, you know, kind of continue to break. And it can be a couple reasons. If like this happened at an, at an event once, I, I was amazed. But if you take a look at that image on the left, you'll notice that the needle is literally pierced through the bobbin case. Now that's a plastic bobbin case, which is very common in many of our machines. And it has left a puncture in the bobbin case. You can see on the image on the right with the red arrow. So believe it or not, even though that's just a small nick, you really have to throw that away and replace it with a new, uh, a new needle. So why does this happen? Well, this can happen because uh, the needle is not the right strength. It's not the right size. And the bobbin spins, you know, at a continuous path. But if that needle is not strong enough and it gets deflected, it can literally pierce like that. Yeah. And Julie, oh, I'm glad I'm comforting you because it hasn't been that comforting to me. And nice to see you here, Julie. Thanks for joining us all the way from Oregon, I think, right? Okay, let's see. And Martha, you're afraid of sticky stabilizer. Does it clog up the needle? Well, um, some brands can clog up the needle, but you know, if you have um, diaper wipes or a cotton swab with um, rubbing alcohol on it, you can, you know, swipe that needle occasionally during the embroidery project uh, if there is any buildup. It's not as bad as you think. When I think about water soluble, I mean the uh, adhesive stabilizer, I'm more concerned not of the embroidery process, but if I want to keep that stabilizer in the item that I'm embroidering on, 
after I'm done embroidering. Like if it's a garment, do I want to wear that? So that's what I usually take into consideration. That definitely. Okay. So let's, oop. now this image here um, is the needle has fallen out of, you know, the needle bar. And that's a, a lack of not tightening up the needle, you know, tight enough. So now that I am of a certain age, I always use a screwdriver to get that last little tight, you know, twist when I insert a needle. I don't want to make it so tight that I can't remove it. But I find that just that little bit of help with that screwdriver after I insert a new needle really ensures that this doesn't happen anymore because that's really annoying when that happens. Okay, textured fabrics can present a lot of um, problems for us, right? For instance, let's take a look at this uh, terry cloth, this really lovely lofty terry cloth towel. And you can see the satin stitches that you see here are allowing the, the terry cloth loops to kind of, you know, flow through the uh, satin stitches. And I would also say that the stitch, the design with uh, the portion of the design that has those open stitches is a rather poor selection of design for a terry cloth towel. Because no matter what kind of treatment I do to that design, it's never going to camouflage the loops that are coming through it. So I would be better off choosing a solid satin for that. So how can you um, top this? Well, a water-soluble topper makes a big difference. Look at the difference in those Florida leaves, the two that are on the bottom of the design at, that did not have the topper as compared to the two on the top that have the, the topper. Uh, let's see. Okay, Candace, you want to know what is the recommended needle size for embroidering? Are there rules? Well, there are guidelines and um, we can do a whole Facebook live on that in the future because it, it's kind of a, it's a pointy topic. <laughs> and when we talk about that, guess who I'm going to ask to help me do, do that? That's Deborah Jones for sure because she is an expert at that. Oh, and here, there's uh, Bernice wants to give a shout out to Julie Cox at Riches. So, yeah, you bet. She is the best. You are lucky to have her if she is your um, dealer. Absolutely. Okay, so Deborah Morgan, use a topper? Definitely. And if you don't have a topper, can water-soluble stabilizer be used for textured fabric? Yes, as long as it's film type that you can tear away. You wouldn't want to use the mesh type in as a topper. It's uh, pretty much too difficult to remove. I mean, not really too difficult, but you have to launder the whole item. And with the film type, you can just tear it away. Now here we have a faux fur that has a really long fiber to it, right? And here it, it's a Christmas stocking. So we wanna monogram that with Sir Bentley's name. Sir Bentley happens to be a, a little puppy. And I got this image from my Stitches sister, Marie Zeno. This was one of her customers that called her up on, you know, December 23rd and say, hey, do you mind? I just have one little thing. Could you just do this project for me on December 23rd? <laughs> you know, Marie's a commercial embroiderer. She goes, sure. And then Marie says, the hairy beast arrives on her doorstep. So that's a challenge to embroider. And imagine as a commercial embroiderer, at the end of all that Christmas preparation and, and uh, all that Christmas stitching for your customers, the last thing you want to be confronted with is something like this. So she um, used what we would call is a nap blocker or a low fill oval shape to stitch first on that fiber so that the beautiful lettering can sit on top of it and really be legible. So let's take a look at how you would. Oh, and another example of that is here on a shorter fiber, um, but also, you know, another faux fur, kind of a plush fabric and Oliviana, beautiful name. So in our Perfect Embroidery Pro, we have a built-in feature in our utility that you, if you stitch, if you create your text like Olivia or Oliviana and type that in Perfect Embroidery Pro, you then select that text and right click 
and scroll down the menu to utility and out on utility, you would create nap blocker. And when you do that, it the settings are 3.5 and a density of 1.0. Um, let's see, we're not, it's not keeping up with me. So I'm gonna do that and then come back. And there we go. And we're still not caught up. They're not talking well to each other. Okay, there we go. So in the Liviana, Hmm. This is in the properties box. <laughs> I think there's a gremlin in here today. I really do. I think there is. I should look under the table over there. But actually, I'm all alone right here. All alone right here. So let's see if we can get this to keep up with us. All right. Everybody's on the same page. So in here in the property box is the density settings that you would create for if you wanted to make an oval fill. It is Judy Warren. What is the oval called? Uh, nap blocker. And it won't actually come in as, a, as an oval. We'll do an, a separate lesson on that. Okay. Carol DeGarris, don't you just love technology? Yeah, it's exciting, isn't it? What would we do without it? And Ashley Jones, this is who I need here, right? She's our wizard, our absolute dime educator wizard. She has a degree in IT. So if she was in this room, we wouldn't have any of these problems. But okay, relax. We're okay, right? So What's the best defense about a planning uh, for success is taking all the steps and thinking it through so that you can um, have success. So number one thing I do is test my designs on fabric that is the same as my intended project. So in this instance, on the left is a t-shirt knit and I test designs on an old t-shirt that I have cut open the sides and it, I've just filled it with embroidery designs. Now I'm never going to wear it. I'm never going to give it to anybody, but um, someday I, you know, I'll throw it away once it's filled. I also have a terry cloth towel that I do the same thing on because that way I, I can test my densities. I can see if I'm going to get enough fill. I can see if there's any fibers that are going to work their way through. So that's the number one step for planning for success. And then the other is to, for placement because placement can be a real issue, you know, and you, if you don't plan properly, you could be very disappointed. We make a perfect placement kit that comes with 15 different templates that allow you to make con consistent placement on multiples. So if you're doing a stack of towels or napkins or shirts, left chest, center chest, you're going to get them all to match in the same place. And that's our perfect placement kit. So I always do that first, for sure, whenever I'm planning a project. Uh, and this is how it works. It's really very simple. You know, you there's guidelines in there, like fold your towel in half, open, mark the center, open it up, place the template on the towel using the alignment marks that are on the template, and then placing a target sticker in the opening. And that way, you know where your needle is going to land, right? You, you'll then hoop your fabric so that the needle is aligned with the crosshair of the template. I mean, of the, the, the your needle is aligned with the crosshair of the target sticker, and then you're good to go. And it's a sure thing, and I wouldn't embroider with, without it. <clears throat> um, also, printing templates is very important. That's going to show you how to, um, where to place the embroidery, and you also have a printed crosshair. Now, you would use that with stabilizer that you already, uh, not with stabilizer, with software. So let's see, um, Reetha wanted to know if you can use the Target stickers with your Baby Lock Solaris. Baby Lock and Brother Machines will not recognize our Target stickers in the uh, auto positioning. So you can't use that feature, but you most certainly can manually do it. Or you could use it with your live camera is what I often do. Okay, on the perfect print and stitch Target template paper, 
here you can see I have an embroidery design. I believe this is the happy flower design that I have printed out. And notice that crosshair, especially that long vertical line. I use that when I'm quilting so that I can make sure my design is going perfectly straight north and south. And you can see that it is positioned parallel to the seam line on the left. And as long as it is, you know, let's say it's a half inch away from that seam line at the top of the, of the design and the same at the bottom, then I know my embroidery design is gonna come out perfectly square or straight. And cause you know, when you're in a big project, you often, uh, you know, you feel like you're out in the middle of no man's land. So it's important to, you know, have some guidelines and to use that. Okay. Oh, I just did something really bad. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's move on. So another big problem is things falling into the design area on top of the hoop. And I don't mean pets. <laughs> That's your problem. I don't have a solution for that. Okay. So here I have a grocery tote bag that I'm going to embroider. I have my embroidery design placement marked with a target sticker and I've turned my bag inside out. So the right side is exposed in the hoop, but it is all inside out. And the reason that I do that is when I place it on my machine, I'm going to lift the outer bag over the hood of the machine. Now I don't have to worry about the machine capturing, you know, the top of the bag and letting it stitch in right into the sewing field. So it's just a great way to keep it out of harm's way. You might want to tape or pin the strap to the bag so that also doesn't fall into the sewing field. And here you can see on a multi-needle machine, you don't really have to worry about that so much because on a multi-needle machine, I would hoop it right side out because it's a tubular item that I can then slide right into the arms of the machine. So on a multi-needle, it's right side out. On a single needle, it's inside out. And then of course, when you're quilting, you don't want that roll to fall into the, into the sewing field. And so I've used hoop guard here and I have hoop guard positioned on the right side of the hoop so that that's where my roll is, right? And I don't want that to fall in. And you know, when I did that red ribbons quilt a couple of weeks ago, that 90 by 90 inch quilt, I never ever had a, the roll fall into the sewing field with over 80 hoopings. I was thrilled with that, just thrilled with that. I'm gonna back up a minute because um, Reen Wilcoxon. Hi, Reen. Thanks for joining us today. She wants to know, will the hoop guard work in this situation? Well, actually, I think this is an easier solution than the hoop guard because if I, I don't like to put hoop guard on the left part of the hoop because it won't, the embroidery foot and, you know, the, the threader, all of the business business that's on the left side of the needle would maybe hit the hoop guard. So hoop guard is, is designed to always be positioned on the right side of the hoop, like it's shown here in the quilt, or in the front of the hoop on a onesie. And again, we're not, uh, just bear with Uh, okay, so I hope that answered your question, Judy. Irene, sorry, <laughs> I have a lot of screens going on here. Uh, okay, so on hoop guard, on a onesie, now I put it in the front of the hoop. And this lets me open up that whole onesie area, again, on a single needle machine. This onesie is hooped inside out so that the garment front is actually in the hoop, that's what's hooped, and the back of the onesie is on top of the hoop, but pulled over hoop guard. So that works out really well. I love that product for that. Here's kind of a better image that maybe gives you a, a better clue as to what's going on. So uh, you can see here how it's pulled in the back, and, and, and then the excess, like the, the snap opening, is in the front. Okay, uh, let's see. 
here is um, just this is how it is attached to the hoop. And you know, it's metal, right? And my hoop is magnetic. So it's going to snap right onto the bottom of that, stay in place. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to worry about it at all. Okay. Typos. Do you have a Facebook live on how to embroider a quilt? Well, we did a whole month on quilting with your embroidery machine. The month of March was uh, quilting. We had Emily Scott Design, uh, Emily Scott Designs, um, Christine Connor was with us on one show. Uh, so you'll have to scroll through and take a look at um, the different ones. But yeah, we've done a lot of quilting with the hoop. We've shown the weightless quilter and so forth. So anyway, super fun. And typos, you know, they happen to even the best of us, even in retail. Now here, this isn't a local grocery store. These are aprons that for sale that were for sale. Queen of everything. You can see it's hanging on the retail rack. It has its tag still in place and hanging right next to it is this design that is missing the Q. <laughs> Imagine. And it's tagged, priced and hanging on the shelf. So I know as home embroiderers, we wouldn't let that out of our sewing room, right? For sure. We would never box that up and hand that to someone as a gift. So um, keep, a, you know, keep an eye out on your typos. And that's an easy one to fix, right? Because you just have to add the cue at the beginning of the design. But even when you're doing multiples, you can make mistakes too. So in this instance, I left out the U in Baker's Beauties. So on the left-hand side, you could see the top left. That was an omission. And apparently I had to rip out all of Beauties for that apron and fix that. But, oh, what are you gonna do? No, these things happen. Now, bird nesting is a problem that happens to us. And you know, it only happens when you absolutely fall in love with the item that you are working on. If you are testing a design, if you are testing a design, most likely you won't have any problems. But when you really fall in love with that project, that's when the bird's nesting, um, that's when it starts to really happen. So what does that look like? Well. I'm sorry that I don't have a photo of it in, in actuality, like, you know, at the moment before I stopped cursing, maybe, shall we say. So, but this is what it looks like, right? And here's my needle plate that I have taken off the machine. You can see everything that's underneath of it. This is the wrong side of the plate. And look at all of that thread that is built up underneath. It is really a, a terrible problem. So we have a product called the bird's nest tool that is a very long blade with a hook, a second device in the box that allows you to get that, get to that thread while it is all stuck together. Because, you know, this only happens when you are, um, you know, it's stuck in between the two, right? So you have your, your fabric and your hoop on the machine bed. And now you, you know, you have a problem and you can't get your scissors in there. First of all, you most certainly can't get your hand in there and you can't get your scissors in there. So the bird's nest tool comes in a nice little zipper case. It has um, the hook and it has the the blade itself, which comes with a very nice cover and an extra set of two blades are in this little silver package. It's very careful. You know, you should just keep that in a safe place. But then when I have my hook, I can now slide this underneath the hoop. And meanwhile, while that's holding the threads apart, I can then go in and just slice that away. Oh my goodness, is an absolute must have. Some of our educators call this embroidery insurance. It's just like automobile insurance that you would purchase, right? Because, well, it's the law in many states, you most certainly have to have embroidery, auto insurance. But, you know, if you have a really good policy, 
nothing's ever going to happen to you, right? Nothing's ever going to happen to you. But the minute it, ex it, it expires or maybe you miss a payment or something, that's when accidents happen. And it's the same thing with the embroidery uh, bird's nest for sure. So it's like insurance. Once you have it and you'll have it in your room, you, hopefully you never have to use it, but you might, you might have to use it. You never know. And it's just good to, um, to have it when you need it. Let's see. Uh, she says it works great. Shelly Clark. And she hasn't had a bird's nest since she bought it. See, it's insurance, right? I'd rather have it and not have a bird's nest than have it. Yep, definitely. Okay. So thread shedding. Now, thread shedding can happen for several reasons. Number one, it could be a poor quality thread. And um, if that's the case, then, you know, up your game and get a high quality thread, one that you can really depend on and know that it is always going to perform properly for you. If you are digitizing your own designs, it could be stitch length. This is a, uh, an image of a problem that I had when I was doing my farmhouse panels and I digitized that quilting myself. And I wanted nice, tiny stitches, right? Really nice, tiny um, stitches that would look so elegant on that farmhouse panel and really mimic w the wood grain. Well, I learned that um, my stitches were too short. They were like a 1.5 and boy, it just shredded that thread all day long. So was, I went back into my software and then I had, uh, I lengthened that stitch length in the, it, this is a run stitch to 2.4. Beautiful. Never had another break through all of those um, sample testing and the finished samples of the uh, farmhouse panels. And, you know, then I apply that knowledge to my next project, my next digitizing project, right? So I'm, you know, you learn when I said earlier in the beginning, you often make mistakes when we first begin to embroider. But as our skills get um, elevated, or maybe we start to stretch a little bit and try new techniques or like learn how to digitize. And now you're making your own designs and now you're encountering some problems that you had earlier in your career. So, you know, you'll learn from each of these steps. And so now I know 1.5 is just way too short for quilting. And why is that? Well, we have a quilt backing, we have a quilt top, and we have batting in between. It's just too close penetrations for the needle to get in and get out of those tiny stitches. So, and Patty LaCroix, these problems just happened to you this week. Well, yeah, I'm sure it has. We're all home stitching, right? So hopefully you're learning from your mistakes like I do too. Okay, uh, let's see. What is next? Finishing. You know, it's always a good idea to bring a professional finish to your work. So tearaway stabilizer is often tempts us to just rip it out of the hoop. Well, if you have basted your um, project together first with a basting file, then it's always a good idea to remove those basting stitches first. And if you flip the project, project over and remove the basting stitches from the back, they're, they're easier to release. You just have to snip a couple of those stitches and then the whole long thread will pull out. And then it's, it's best to, uh, okay, so now I'm removing, removing that thread from the top. So you see when you snip that bobbin thread in the back, two or three snips, then you can flip it over and you just pull away that top thread and it's gone. For now, this is where I'm tempted to just tear that out of the tearaway stabilizer, right? That's uh, it's sitting on top of. But really, it's better to flip that hoop over and push the sta the fa the fabric, the embroidery away from that tearaway stabilizer. Use your thumbnail to just kind of poke it out so that you're not be doing anything, you know, really kind of violent to your beautiful embroidery that you've been working on for so long, right? So it's best to just treat that gently and uh, push it out from the back. Now, sometimes if you're using a cutaway specifically, this is a, a uh, few so soft um, cutaway. No, it's a no-show mesh, I guess I should say. So it's a no-show. And 
if this is a cotton fabric and once it this long design this was two hoopings was stitched on that cotton fabric on the right hand side it puckered which was very disappointing to me so i learned that first off you're going to trim that excess stabilizer and leave about a quarter inch at least a quarter inch beyond the stitching uh, and then once you do that slice with a pair of scissors slice through that stabilizer between the two designs and then look how much that stabilizer had shrunk during the pressing process because without that you know you always I always press right i take it out of the hoop and then i press it so that it looks so beautiful and that's when the shrinking or puckering often occurs and it's because that no show mesh can shrink during the press so um, if you just slid it in between those two designs now it relaxes and it looks absolutely beautiful so that is my presentation on mishaps i mean i've sure have made lots more than that i most certainly have but um these are the ones that i took the time to uh take a photograph and and um exhale right first that's the first thing you do is exhale maybe get a piece of chocolate i know like some people like to get a glass of wine uh whatever your poison is that helps you relax go right ahead and do that but um i you know i once you get that done and then just step away from the project for a moment often it's salvageable it really is there are uh so many tips that we all i mean so many problems that we come up with during the process let's see misha wants to know would you recommend placing interfacing fusible interfacing on the back after finishing that are long yes um yeah that's a great idea i most certainly would use fuse so soft which is a fusible trico interfacing on the back of embroidery and that makes it so much more comfortable on the skin so especially with you know garments and she asked about pillowcases I, maybe i would do it on a pillowcase Probably I wouldn't because uh, on the back side, on the inside of a pillowcase, I don't think it would touch anybody's skin. But if you just want to do it like for longevity, no problem. Why wouldn't you? It's almost, it's translucent. It's not going to leave any kind of shadow, um, you know, from the right side. So that's a good idea. Uh, and let's see, Ashley says, she always makes a ton of mishaps when she's tired. You know, very true. Me, I'm a morning person. So I, if I have a very challenging project ahead of me, I like to plan for it in, in the afternoon or the evening, depending on my schedule. And then in the morning, I'll get up and tackle that and, and you know, fingers crossed and all that kind of stuff, right? And, oh, well, thank you, Rita, for your kind comments and also Iris. Yeah, you know, let's see, there's always, uh, we're always learning from each other, for sure. I learn from all of you all the time. And then Judy Warren wants to know, do you take out the stabilizer in the small areas of the monogram on tearaway? That's a good question. Um, I, I personally do not do that. I often use as much as I can on a cotton fabric piece and stitch wash away tearaway stabilizer. So I'm able to tear that away, but after it's uh, anything that's left after laundering will just disintegrate into like fibers. It's similar to putting a tissue in, through the wash. So that's how I treat my tear away. But if it's a stiff tear away, then um, if it's going to cause bleed through to the to the outer, the, the good side, then maybe I would take the time to pick out the tear away. But otherwise, probably not. And do I have any vid videos on stabilizer to use? You have an awful time with puckering i do not but that is a great project uh, a, a great title for a new one so we'll keep that in um in uh mind for sure and dory hobson nice to have you here dory she says someday i'll tell you all about catching a collar while i'm brooding on the back of a vest oh, oh yeah well <laughs> definitely okay so next week we do have um an exciting guest that I want to share with you. And that is uh, Joanne Banco is going to join me. Now, Joanne is a brother ambassador and maybe you have seen her on It's So Easy. Here she is on the It's So Easy 
um, television set. She also has a, a website where let's go, it's www.letsgoso. She's an author of Wrapped in Embroidery, which was Dime, which was published by Dime several years ago. She was a, a very often con time contributor to Designs and Machine Embroidery magazine, and she is an excellent embroiderer. Her techniques and her methods and her work is just outstanding. And I can tell you from um, you know knowing that. I would be the one that would receive her projects when they came in for a photo shoot. And oh my goodness, her garments were flawless. Her insides were as good as her outsides. And that's something that I could never say my garments are like that. So you're going to really enjoy learning with her because she is, uh, we're going to talk a lot about placement and continuous embroidery. She's a master at that. She has some very good tips on how to do that. Uh, yeah, and Ashley um, Jones, she just reminded me that uh, someone had asked about, do you have, Retha Reinke had asked about videos on stabilizers. We don't have videos, but our Embroiderer's comp Compass that was written by Deborah Jones is the Bible on what stabilizer and needle size to use. So if you don't have that in your sewing room, you really need to get that. It is, it's in my sewing room at home. It hangs right on my pal. I'm going to show you all that next week, but um, that's a great thing to have in your sewing room for sure. So I do hope that you will join me here next week. We'll be um, right back at one o'clock on Thursday and with Joanne Banco on April 23rd at one o'clock. So I hope to see you there. Thanks for joining me.